Thursday, March 11th, I just call this meeting of the Finance Committee to order. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Laws, Chapter 38, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the Town of Chelmsford Finance Committee will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information, the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town's website at www.chelmsfordma.gov. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to watch the meeting may do so by accessing the Chelmsford Telemedia website, www.chelmsfordtv.org. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the town's website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Uh, if you wish to watch this meeting, please do not, and do not plan to present to the committee or speak during public comment. We ask you please do so at live.chelmsfordtv.org or on your television, Comcast Channel 99 or Verizon Channel 37. By doing so, you will help reduce demand on the online meeting platform. Thank you. Uh, seeing as there's no chat function this evening, there will be no chat, so I'm going to make a comment regarding that. Our first item on the agenda is approval of minutes for February 25th, 2021. Has everyone had a chance to review them? Yes. All right. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we accept the meeting minutes of February 25th as presented. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That's a 7-0 acceptance. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. Uh, first on the agenda this evening is the review of the fiscal year 22 budget for PEG Access Cable. And with us this evening is Pete Padula the executive director of Chancellor Telemedia. Hi, Pete. Hello. Uh-oh. Are you? Um, can I share my screen? Yeah. Let me give, let me give one second. Jim, do you want to put up the presentation? Actually, I will put up. So uh, uh, um, Anita okay. put together a PowerPoint for the first section of our meeting. Oh, that's fine. PowerPoint will show um, stuff such as your as your budget this year, Pete. Okay, great. But unless it's different than that, I'll, I'll I'll put that on the screen. Now yep, that'll work fine, and I'll it'll be I'll be brief. Okay. Um, I did have one other slide, which is really not relevant, not necessary. Uh, just showing, uh, I'll give you an overview real quick of the um, the income situation, which really just is mirroring the market, and it's the same spiel I've given you every year for the last three years. Is that we are seeing a slight decline every year. Uh, it's really between three, almost 4%. So that's really, again, that is just what we're facing. Uh, we're fine for now, but I think, you know, we'll just have to see how things go as, uh, as the marketplace um, changes or for one way or the other. Um, in terms of our budget, it's basically level funded. Um, you can see, um, ooh, I'm gonna need, yeah. So there are, there are just a couple of items that um, I just wanted to call your attention, uh, attention to. Uh, the, um, the wages and salaries are level funded and that is because um, we, um, oh, this doesn't have the 2022, does it? No? No, this does not. I'm seeing it here right now. Um, if you want to let me share my screen, I have it ready for you. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. okay. There we go. All right. So I will share this right here and this puppy right there. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. And you can see this, right? That's the page we want. Um, if you can see that first item in orange, uh, that is our salaries, which are virtually the same. And the reason for that is because we had a resignation in the fall and um, we're uh, very excited actually to finally, uh, uh, because of the pandemic, we took our time and we were really uh, sort of putting some new thoughts against that position, but we're about ready to post that job. Um, but we do believe we're gonna, you know, make some, make up some savings there. Um, and at least that's our goal. So that's why we're level funded. We were able to do the 
um, the cost of living and the step increases for the existing staff. And then we'll look for this new position at that level. Um, the uh, equipment maintenance has a huge, gigantic change, 90% less. That's something that um, is because what we have done about five years ago, we bought a new broadcast server system, which included one year of service. And then we realized that every year it was very expensive. Uh, they gave us a three year deal, which we didn't take right away because we were a little bit concerned about the longevity of the company. So, um, you know, the way it is in technology. So while we were waiting to just make sure we were paying the extra, extra expensive yearly price, but now we feel more comfort comfortable. So I had budgeted for the big long, it's, I think it's a four year package and we've already taken care of that. Uh, it was close to 30 grand. So we're back down to our normal equipment maintenance budget. That's why that item is so um, bizarre. Um, and the others are really just, I upped our contracted services just because really, because we've been using a lot in uh, the pandemic, we've been using some extra help and I'm not sure if that's gonna continue or not. Um, and um, the dues and subscriptions is really just a minor change uh, to get back to real, I think I was off last year. So we're back to fiscal 20. And then our capital outlay is, is, is just the budget, the line item that we always use to just make up the difference. You know, if you remember, I'm making a projection for fees and we're just gonna work with whatever capital we have. So um, that's, that's why that changes a little bit. So that's really basically it. I mean, the department's doing well. We're, we've been tap dancing along with everybody else during the pandemic and um, you know, um, I'll be glad when it's over, but otherwise, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't want to take up all your time. Things are good and we feel good. I, I'm happy to answer any questions. I just to uh, point out, I don't know if, if the exhibits end up going in, in a committee book or somewhere, but I think on that top section for personnel, Pete, I think your year over year change was comparing 22 to 2020 because it's $11,000 change and it's only like a thousand bucks. So I think it's probably just a formula error in your spreadsheet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I see it. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, yep. yep, it's probably a formula error somewhere. And I, this is probably just my note notes. So, um, although it actually may not be. So I'll, I'll talk to John and we'll make sure that that's correct. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, seeing none. Thanks, Pete, appreciate okay. it. Have a good meeting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving along, we have the, uh, next we have the review of the fiscal year 22 budget for the health department. With us this evening is, this is Rosa, the uh, BSNRN uh, public health director. Hey, Jim, can you project? Yeah, yes, give me a second. I have to take it, take it back. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I appreciate you having me um, here before the Finance Committee. Uh, needless to say, the last year has been incredibly challenging for the Health Department. But I think if you um, look at my budget, we are kind of in the midst right now of going through just a couple of changes. Um, if you happen to have a chance to look at the budget narrative as far as the salaries and everything at the top, you will notice under my budget narrative that um, I did receive a merit increase in um, December which of course would not be reflected in the fiscal year 21 budget um, as shown on the screen. My, I had a health inspector resign uh, in the beginning of February. And so currently my department assistant is actually taking over that health inspector's position. So right now she's actually doing two jobs because we have not hired uh, a department assistant to replace her. We did do interviews last week. We have second interviews next Monday. And hopefully we, um, we have three people that we're um, providing secondary interviews for. So hopefully by the beginning of April, we will have a new department assistant. 
um, within the Board of Health. So the number that you see, um, okay, so this is not the breakdown of the salaries. The, what I had um, submitted to John for the department assistant is, is what was allocated for the current department assistant. So that may change once we actually hire somebody else. Um, Amanda Glasser is still with us as our health educator and her salary is still split um, between the Board of Health and the school department. That doesn't, that has not um, changed at all. And at the current time, the only people that qualify for longevity in the department are myself and, and Mark Marciello. As far as the expenses, the line item expenses, everything has pretty much stayed the same. I did increase the contracted services because um, I have noticed that the costs for the our Xerox machine have increased. So I did increase that a little bit. And then every year it seems as if the cost of the supplies for the mosquito uh, spraying project seemed to go up a little bit. So there was a little bit of an increase in, in that as well. Any questions? All right. With uh, out the chat, it's tough to see if people have questions. questions. <laughs> Let me see. Well, I just want to take a few minutes. Oh. I hear the echo. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you hear an echo? I, I've muted people. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to take a few minutes to thank Sue Rosa and her team for um, all the work they did this past year with COVID, um, with all the tracing, with the, um, the vaccination clinics, with the first responders getting um, our town and the surrounding towns all vaccinated, and even with um, doing the first I think first clinic, one or two clinics with the seniors um, over 75. I know that was a huge benefit. A lot of seniors who were able to get in um, were very grateful for that. And I want to personally thank um, Sue for doing her and her team for putting in all the hours to really go above and beyond and make sure that our town is being vaccinated. Um, you know, I do realize that, you know, the governors pulled that away from the towns. And I think that's unfortunate because I do believe that. Um, our local board of health can really reach out to those who, um, you know, are not in the best of shape that can go these far distances to get these vaccines. But I do want to just personally thank Sue Rosa and her team for doing what they've done. Thank you, Anita. Uh, I also, being over 75 and having had the uh, privilege to um, have the vaccination in town, uh, really appreciate it very much. And want to tell you, it was one of the best run things I've ever seen in my life. It was just first class. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a lot of work, but we do have a good team and we did. I'm, I'm very disappointed that the, that the state did take it away from us to be able to do it locally because we, you know, the first couple of clinics we really learned and then we just had a well-oiled machine. <laughs> Um, can't, can't thank you enough. Thank you. And Anita as well. All right. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, thank you very much, Sue. Appreciate you being here this evening. And thank you for the continued work. Thank you. Moving along our agenda this evening, uh, we have uh, the review of the warrant article, I'm sorry, review of the uh, warrant article 20, which is the on-site uh, sewage facility revolving fund. And I guess Sue, you'll also speak on that. Uh, yeah. I don't know if there's any, any uh, particular, I can, I can put up the article here for you. Okay. 
basically what we're doing here with Article 20 is asking to establish um, an on-site sewage revolving account where the Board of Health would be able to use this account specifically and only for on-site septic systems um, in town. Since we have the moratorium in place as far as people tying into town sewer, we, um, as you all know, we are reverting to um, any new homes, new developments, um, unless they had already been tied in and unless they're kind of replacing an existing structure, uh, they're not gonna be able to tie into town sewer based on a capacity and they'll have to put in an onsite uh, septic system. So because the health department doesn't have uh, the capacity to do all that is involved with every one of these inspections from beginning to end, we actually um, interviewed two different companies and we signed a contract with Mill River Consulting uh, to do our inspections, our plan reviews, our so uh, contract, the soil testing and everything that's involved in having um, a septic system. And you know, initially, if you know, if you happen to be reading my um, my narrative part of my my board of health budget, you know, I very much underestimated the number that potentially would would be coming into town. And I said, oh, maybe if we have eight, uh, it's pretty tough to to try to guesstimate exactly how many we're going to have. But then I had a conversation with um, Evan Belansky, and I asked him. And he said, probably on average, you're probably talking around 25 different new buildings at an average year, you know, give or take. And with every single one of those, there is a lot involved from beginning to end. So it didn't make sense to just try to add a line item budget to my budget for on-site septic, because that line item budget would have to be, you know, $70,000, $75,000. So it only makes sense to ask for a revolving line of credit. Essentially what would happen is obviously anybody that is um, doing a development, putting in one of these systems, they come to the health department, they fill out the application um, and the permit, they would pay the fee at that point in time. Um, that fee, of course, um, if we get granted this revolving account, would that money would be placed into that account. Mill River does all the work for us and then Mill River will bill us and we will just continue it um, that way. But in order to, to start, we actually need money in the account to kind of begin the whole process. So that's the purpose of asking for this revolving account. So everything like Title V tests and certificates will be, will be uh, handled through Mill River and they'll be, the, the funds will be charged against this account going forward? Yes. Okay. I don't have anything to that effect right now. So, so right now we're just hoping and watching that, you know, we may not have too many between now and the end of June um, so that I don't have to go for a, a budget adjustment for my current year. Okay. Is it expected that the, that the, the fees collected will cover uh, the expenses that we need, need to pay or is it gonna be at yes. disparity? Okay. So, so what we did is when we went, when the Board of Health uh, signed the contract with Mill River, what we did is depending on what type of inspection it was, uh, because for example, an initial um, plan review is, is $750, um, it, it's expensive. And so what we did is depending on what the inspection was, we added anywhere from um, 25 to $100 fee to our own permitting process for us to, to process that. So that will just all go back into that, that same account. I, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so once you get started, the this, this revolving account will basically be uh, fed off the fees you collect from the people, the application fees, and then you'll just pay out of it. I, are you asking here for $75,000 to start? And yes. Where, where is the 75, what is the source of that 75,000? Is that, is that uh, free cat? Where is the 75,000 to start coming from? I guess is my question. No, no, no Kathy, there's, there's this Paul Cohen. There's no, 
there's no appropriation under this article. It, it's, it just sets the fund limit for the year. Oh, okay. Very similar to the senior trips or the seal of weights and measures and so forth. So, no, there's no appropriation and no funding source. And, and as Sue noted, the fees are collected up front. So we're never in a deficit. So when somebody comes in with a set of plans, they pay the fee up front. And then from that revenue, th that gets expended through the revolving fund. So there's no appropriation from the town. Okay, thank you. I was just confused as if she, need, if she needed some startup money in that account or not. But thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right. Next on our agenda this evening is review of fiscal year 22 budget for the Department of Public Works, including solid waste, sewer, stormwater, and public facilities departments. And with us this evening, we have Gary Persichetti, the Director of Public Works, and I believe Steve Yonley is also here, the Assistant Director of the Department of Public Works. I don't think, is Kathleen on as well? I think Kathleen's yes, on as well. Is. Kathleen Canavan is I'm here. The, uh, yep. facilities, facilities Manager is here as well. Thank you all for being here this evening. We just thank move you. on to... Yep. Thank you and good evening, and thank you for letting us pre present to the Finance Committee. Um, as you'll see, we are very level-funded. There's very few changes to the budgets. Um, we'll start out with the admin engineering like we do. Um, your salaries are based on um, what was put forward to us and that's it. If you look at the expense lines, we're actually um, running about $110 less than last year to close that out. So there's really no huge changes to this or anything that's um, um, going to be out there that's going to show you much. Um, so then if you have no questions, I'll go into public trees. Public trees is staying the same this year. It's uh, 70,000. Um, uh, we seem to be able to just barely get by with that and make it work. So we will continue um, to do that. And uh, I think we are gonna have to look if we wanna continue to stay a tree city and raising that a little because the appropriation that they use for that is a dollar figure per household or person in town. So. Um, we're starting to really get right on the crest of whether we'd be able to stay Tree City. So that may have to go up the following year, maybe by another 5,000 and come out at 75, but not this year. The highway division, again, all the salaries are based on what's been put forth. There's no negotiations on this particular year. Um, when you get down on the line items, you'll actually see that we've decreased from uh, 664 to 662 so we're down a couple of thousand there as well so we've stayed level funding there's been a couple of moves from one line item to the other other than that it's pretty much the same um snow and ice um we're level funding it at the same amount as last year um there's no increase to that at this point are we tracking this year, Gary? Uh, I can tell you right now with, um, as of today, we're sitting on 129,000 with two outstanding bills from a subcontractor and that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're okay there and hopefully we're done. Well, we're <laughs> praying for it, can't guarantee it. Um, so then we'll go into um, Parks Division. Parks Division, as you know, is an extremely small budget. Um, Again, very little changes there. I do want to show the one iron line, which is the grounds maintenance budget, uh, increases by 50% from 10,000 to 15,000. The main reason for that is I, we, we started this last year and I know I came to you and, and let you know what's going on. We really have taken full control of the front of the town's halls, the center common, the traffic islands. And to do that, uh, we are using some outside services of some fertilization along with what we're doing. So that's what the increase is for, to make sure that that stays being maintained the way it is um, for all the town. So you'll see it's an $8,000 increase to the entire, their budget. Um, so that's one that did um, climb up a little bit. 
when you go into um, the public buildings, again, uh, salary is what was put forward. You'll see that there's um, not too many changes there. Electricity is up just to here. Um, the biggest line item that there is going up is the custodial uh, contracted services. That's for this building and the town hall. That's contractual based on a three year. It goes up a little bit each one. Um, again, other than that, it's, it, it's a quite simple funded budget. Uh, the old town hall in the uh, Center for the Arts or the they're um, staying at the 30,000 level. I know you're aware that that takes care of um, the building maintenance. And for us, that's definitely fire alarms, fire extinguishers, elevator inspections. All of that is done by uh, us for them. Street lights staying at 70,000. That's become a really good number ever since the LEDs have gone in. As you know, it used to run at 200,000. So the LEDs have given us the ability to cut that and keep that off as a, hopefully a permanent and it's been so far. So that takes you through the first one. If there's any questions before we go into the sewer, um, I'll be more than happy to answer. Gary, the, the contract of services you mentioned, the three-year deal, what year are we in of that contract? I believe it's two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, moving right along. Okay, sewer enterprise. Um, so salaries again are strictly based on what's put forward. You'll see when you get into the um, line items, uh, equipment repair increased by 25K. Um, and that's because there's some more work that, that needs to be done that's been ticking up. And uh, to offset that, um, we've taken another $25,000 out of the grinder pump line item because we've been tracking so well with that. It's been working fine and um, we're staying up with what we should do. Contracted services is the biggest hunt, uh, jump and that's based on the actual spending of uh, $241,000. Um, that was still excluding the salt well issue. The problem with that is it's, it's such a tough line item because that's mostly um, I work with Weston and Samson for 41 pump stations. Um, and what goes on with that is almost like a moving target sometimes. So um, we try to keep that right with where we should be. And that's why we don't want to look at the 982 actual because that would include, um, you know, what had happened there. Um, and then, of course, the OPEB and the um, debt uh, services are preset um, through John based on what we're doing. And um, there'll be a little talk about the debt services when we talk about the, um, the truck later, the back truck. So um, unless anyone has any questions, I'll save that until we get to that Warren article. Doesn't look like we have any questions. We can move along. Okay, uh, Steve, we'll take you through stormwater. Yep, thank Steve, you. I know you had a uh, presentation sent over to me. What, do you want to put that up now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you want me to try to put it up? Oh, no, I could put it up. I'll okay. just give you a second. That's it, because I'll screw something up. So. <laughs> 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 no, just being honest. <laughs> You'll probably get the chat box if I put it up. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, just, um, I wanted to put a little presentation together because we're we're going to be entering kind of our third third year of uh, since the formation of the stormwater division to comply with EPA's regulations. 
so I just wanted to give a, a little bit of an update um, because the proposed budget uh, in front of you tonight more or less brings the uh, division to what I had originally proposed back in 2017 um, at town meeting uh, that I'm sure we all remember. Um, so again, I just wanted to give a little bit of an update on where we are, what we've been doing and what we have coming uh, before us here over the next few years. So again, just a little bit of a history, you know, we, we formed the enterprise fund back uh, at the Springtown meeting 2017. Uh, if you remember the budget was amended on the floor uh, by 50% more or less. Uh, we were able to make that work. And a few months later, there was some, some litigation. EPA delayed the implementation of the MS4 permit for one year. Uh, we went back in at fall town meeting in 2018. I uh, got a six month budget approved based on that 50% budget from the year prior. Uh, we began sort of assembling crews and things and got people on board uh, spring of 2019. And we began our initial work, you know, for compliance with the permit, our outfall inspections. That's, that's a, a picture of an outfall uh, to the right of the screen there. Uh, number 295, you know, it's an outlet. Uh, we have those flip books. We go around our annual inspections on all 600 and some odd of these things. Um, again, we did that. Uh, we've been doing some easement maintenance. You can go ahead to the next slide. So again, just some work to date. Uh, the crews have repaired 68 structures or replaced them. Uh, we've replaced 10 different culverts, uh, some detention pond maintenance. We have a little more than 50 detention ponds in town on all the little streets. You see the picture to the right. This is on Poplar Lane, right up uh, by North Road and Princeton Street, North Chelmsford, a little cul-de-sac there. This probably hadn't been, this is kind of a mid-work picture. So obviously clearing all the brush. Uh, kind of reestablishing what these are supposed to be. We've done quite a few of these over the last few years. Again, you know, our outfall inspections, um, Courtney, the stormwater engineer has begun with the help of some interns. We've done a uh, sampling on, on hundreds of these outfalls. Uh, per the permit, we have to sweep the streets twice a year. So it's more or less from snow melt to snowfall. Uh, the sweepers are running catch basins and inspections, we have to track the material that's removed from each catch basin. So in the past, we've had contracted uh, catch basin cleaners. And so we had guys basically riding around chasing the catch basin cleaners. Now, if you remember last year, uh, we were funded, we purchased our own vehicle. You'll see that we have it now. It was delivered a few weeks back. That'll be, you know, right after we start sweeping here, hopefully within the next few weeks, if weather stays with us, that truck will be on the road um, shortly thereafter, uh, cleaning all the basins. We can so we can do that all in house, clean them, inspect them, move to the next one. We all at the same time. I think it'll work uh, work out very well. Again, um, filling in the holes in our system mapping. That's a that's a critical point in the permit. It's having a full map of our system. So we've been filling in some of the gaps. You know, we had rebuilt things, didn't have adequate as built. So we've been spending a lot of time, uh, mainly on main roads, uh, things like that, just filling in, filling in gaps. And again, the last line item on this slide is the, uh, the easement maintenance uh, permitting. That has all changed in the last few years with DEP. We used to run under a, under a kind of a blanket permit uh, allowed us to do things town wide. Now we have to permit each one individually. So we've done, we've we had a couple of test runs at it as a back and forth with DEP. So that seems to be moving along pretty good. We have a, we have a few permitted now. I know um, engineering staff has been permitting uh, a few more. So hopefully, you know, once we get a good system going, we can continue because we have we have miles and miles of drainage easements through town uh, that that need. Uh, maintenance. Uh, again, just touching, this was something funded uh, in the first year. The stormwater master plan uh, was completed last year. We had a 12-person committee. 
I know uh, Kathy here on the finance committee served on this committee, uh, which three members of the DPW and nine residents. Uh, the process took eight or nine months. We reviewed you know, everything you see here on the screen, uh, water resources, the uh, Western and Samson did stream assessments. They looked at flooding areas, looked at what we need to do fully for permit compliance. They assessed um, roughly 240 culverts in town. We have, you know, somewhere around 400, but they were able to really assess uh, about 240. Uh, advised us in the master plan of some retrofit and uh, BMP best management practice ideas that we can do uh, around town uh, as well as develop the 20 year capital plan. Uh, so on the next slide, I think you'll see it's just kind of a sample of uh, one of the culvert inspections. You know, you get the, the first sheet to the left that gives you the location, the identification number, um, sort of a brief uh, kind of overview, list deficiencies and a recommendation. And then the next uh, to the right, would be the second page of the report for this particular culvert. And it's, it's a photo of the inlet and the outlet of the culvert. This happens to be um, large corrugated metal pipe up by uh, Sunny Meadow Farm on Robin Hill Road. Uh, the, next, the next slide, you know, it's a little tough because these were all 11 by 17 in the actual master plan, but this is uh, sheet two of 13 of the capital plan. It was a, a quite involved matrix to kind of slot these things for years, you know, what we could do with town staff, what we'd have to contract out. So again, it, it turned into a, a, a full 20 year plan um, with the amount of work that, that was there to be done. So looking forward, um, the proposed budget um, that's in front of you tonight, Again, it brings the uh, division uh, to what I had originally proposed back at Springtown meeting in, in 2017. Uh, staffing, I'm proposing to increase by two um, to bring us to 11 full employees. Uh, if you remember my original proposal had 12. So in a way we almost kind of got our feet wet and saw what we could do, couldn't do. So it allowed me to, we can move forward with one less employee than what I originally had thought. Um, this budget will allow us to really get going on, on again, that 20 year capital plan, maintain our, our um, sweeping twice a year, you know, and the catch basin cleaning, uh, full inspections, uh, our operations permit compliance, continue with our 25% uh, outfall sampling. So that, that works out to, you know, roughly 150 a year we have to sample um, at twice a year, that is too, spring and fall dry and, and wet weather. Um, and then inspections and enforcement. And if you look at this picture on the right, this is a, um, a neighborhood. I don't want to, you know, that we've had some uh, incidents, I guess, <laughs> uh, with some uh, motor oil and paint being dumped into a storm drain. Um, again, don't do that. That's illegal. <laughs> uh, the neighbors up there tend to tend to call on this resident. So um, again, I put that in just as kind of a, an eye that we, we have been around um, in some neighborhoods where there's been some, uh, some dumping like this. Uh, pet waste is, is, a big, uh, is a big problem. Um, so usually when something like this, we get a call, we go out, we do a little in, like kind of a neighborhood mailing, that type of thing, a little, you know, try to get some public interaction education um, seems to, seems to be working again with this budget, uh, we can start getting into some retrofit green infrastructure. That's some of, some of that BMP stuff I was talking about earlier. We're transferring all the data in our inspection forms. We're developing an asset management system right now, uh, that'll integrate with the GIS. So all our inspection forms, uh, will be sort of through the GIS system, we can do them right on a tablet in the field. So we're transitioning all that into that now, hopefully by this summer, that'll be, that'll be rolling full steam. Um, again, continuing with the mapping, our IDDE, which is our illicit discharge uh, detection and elimination. Um, we have a, an IDDE bylaw in place. Uh, we just need to make sure we're in compliance with that. And then as you'll see a little bit later um, on your agenda, uh, a, we have a warrant article for a stormwater bylaw, which is also part of the um, MS4 permit required by 
uh, the federal level. And again, thank you for allowing me to, to run that presentation. So if you want to go back to the budget, I can just I can just touch on some of that quick. So yeah, so in the budget again, the uh, the salary line that indicates the addition of two two uh, labor positions. Uh, that that is the the reason for the increase there, and uh, the rest of it is just uh, the overall increase to bring it to again that that original proposal level from 2017. So it's upping, um, you know, our just maintenance lines, our project lines. Um, the computer maintenance line goes up a little bit because of. Um, like I spoke of that on the asset management system we're working on, but it's also the annual subscriptions we pay for GIS and things like that. Uh, we've been lucky so far having to uh, being able to borrow a GPS unit from NIMCOG that has, that has saved us having to, to purchase our own. Uh, but I'm sure as more communities get real deep into this, it'll be harder and harder to get, but we've been lucky so far being able to utilize that there about a, it's about a $15,000 piece of equipment. So we've been, we've been lucky to, to get that from them at no cost. Uh, you'll see the contract services line stays at a hundred thousand. Uh, that was typically to fund. We funded uh, a little more than $80,000 a year to clean catch basins. What I'm doing with that line is uh, removing the, the stockpile of, of catch basin cleanings and street sweepings that staged up at Swain road. Uh, we just bid out uh, a small portion of that, awarded it to a local uh, local trucking firm. Uh, hopefully, start in the next couple of weeks uh, with money left over in current year's budget. Uh, so my goal with that, again, is is to get that pile removed over the next couple of years, and then that number will come down significantly, and I can move that, uh, use that money for. Um, you know, larger projects, additional maintenance, uh, things like that, um, that will help me not have to continue to raise the rates. Um, other than that, the, the debt service line will go up. We'll speak of, we'll speak of a truck later. Uh, and like the sewer enterprise, we get the um, OPEB and all that stuff from, from John Souza. So it's, it's all self-funded in that aspect. Be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Any questions? Dave, can you just comment on the major projects, the 70 to 200 number? Sure. So uh, again, a lot of that is going to be uh, kind of picking off some of the recommendations in the, in the first uh, year of the capital plan. Um, there's some, you know, Headwall replacements, culvert cleaning, flushing, a uh, couple of re uh, small replacement jobs. Uh, there's a there's a retrofit opportunity over at the high school property that we might try to do that takes a lot of the drainage coming off of uh, Old Westford Road. Uh, so that is the uh, the the real reason for the increase in that line. Would you expect that to kind of drop back down, or is that kind of the new level? I expect that to more or less maintain that number every year. Okay. How does the winter affect um, the workload? So initially before we got a lot of snow, uh, the guys were able to do some off-road work. Uh, it's what we used to do through the years, uh, go into some of the easements, you know, you can get off the road and do that type of work. If the weather's with us, you know, they, they um, did a catch basin replacement uh, finished it this morning, started it yesterday over on Riverneck Road. So if the weather's with us, we can do work. Uh, when we get a lot of snow, like we had the last maybe six weeks, uh, they were they were working on the mapping, you know, opening covers, tracing, tracking pipes, uh, getting locations like that. We did a couple of small head wall jobs, things we, we could do, you know, regardless of the snow. Um, again, in a couple of weeks here, you know, once the sweepers stop rolling, it's it's full steam ahead. But you know, we're we're able to do 
uh, quite a bit of quite a bit of work over the winter. Steve, I just wanted to thank you for your overview. It gave us a, a really helpful, full understanding of this year's presentation. Appreciate sure. it. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions on the uh, stormwater department? All right. Thanks, Steve, for going through that. Sure. Next, we have the waste collection. Sure, waste collection. Not much I can say about it, but it is what it is. Um, I think everyone's very well aware of what's going on in the industry today. Um, there's a host of things. Number one, there's no, no, no added and will be no added transfer stations. So when one's down or something's going on, you're fighting to get to the ones that are there, which slows up the operation. The cost of everything has been ra rising as we speak. So you'll see that Cavanther is up to 90 a ton. And... Um, and then the waste contracted itself is up as well from Republic. And another good contributor to this is um, the COVID has, of course, definitely brought people to stay home. So that about 20 to 25 percent of trash that you guys would take with you in your lunches and your snacks and drinks are not going into your dumpsters at your works and your, you know, um, wherever you're going during the day and you're staying home and being added to ours as well. So. Um, you know, that's the effect that we're seeing in this. And then because of the fact that the transfer stations are, are what they are and they're not changing, um, even though we're part of a consortium, our, our bargaining power is nothing like it used to be. I mean, before you could really um, sit down with these guys and beat them up a little more as a group and get a little more out of them. But um, at the end of the day, it is just going to fall back on us because when a, when a truck hits a transfer station and spends 57 minutes in line, the amount of, you know, trash getting done on the average of about 15 is just not there. So everything's backing up. Um, I don't have any other better explanation, but that's it. These are solid figures. We believe we'll make it through the year with it. The only other thing I did want to mention is when you get back to the waste, uh, the personnel services line, you'll see an overtime. It's an increase from 97 to 11,000. And that's because um, based on what's been going, we've added another shredding and another hazardous waste day. Any questions? Okay. No. Thank you. With that, we can go to municipal facilities. Um, again, um, pretty much a level funded budget. Um, you'll see salaries again uh, per what's there. We, uh, we are going basically actually down by a couple of dollars in the total. We were 990 last year, we're at 989 this year. Um, we juggled around some spots more than adding to it. Um, we equipment repair has always been running high, so it went from 350 to 375. Um, and uh, with the other changes that are made, we can we can definitely sustain that um, and keep it basically level funded. Um, the, as we say to you every year. This is a fund that if money was no object, we can easily drop another million dollars into this and, and um, you know, continue with all the HVAC systems, all the building systems that need upgrading, all the um, infrastructure, because the fact is, um, in reality, when you hit the schools, um, the newest school, which was a partial um, renovation of existing and new was 1999 with the center school. And as of course, before that was 1972 with the high school. So um, we don't have a lot of new infrastructure. Um, as you know, we're working on fire stations now, which is still a lot with the older infrastructure. But working with what we can, this is where we're at. Um, again, I think it's a good budget and we should be able to handle it. All right. Any questions? Thank you. All right. 
seeing none thank you all, all three of you for being here this evening um and uh putting together this, these presentations thank you uh of course you'll be sticking around for quite a few warren articles coming up right now <laughs> bear with me one second yeah. Next on our agenda is the review of warrant article nine for the CPS HVAC repairs and upgrades. I will speak to this briefly and then turn it over to Kathleen because her and Melissa, our sustainability manager, have been running this project. Um, as you know, with the COVID and the um, fact that school was totally canceled and then they came back to um, the half days in the hybrid system that they are, the big push with every school system is the HVAC. Do you get the right air exchanges? Are people safe? Can that work? So we went out and we hired companies to help us do this. Uh, it's really three. You have an engineer, you have our controls contractor, and you have a tab contractor, which would be a testing and balancing company. So we are well into this. I'll let Kathleen give you more details about where we kind of stand with this and where we're heading. Hi, I'd like to thank the Finance Committee for the opportunity to pre present and review this article. So as you all know, back in the fall, we were I was given the directive mm -hmm. to um, implement a, a program and hire professionals to oversee the HVAC assessment. And um, basically the project was broken out into three phases. The first phase was to increase our day-by-day -day daily presence in the school systems to assure that if mechanical equipment failed, we would quickly and efficiently react and repair systems, basically motors and ventilation, so as not to fear with the educational spaces and classroom instructions, as well as to make sure we had fresh air going into the classrooms. So we had not only our mechanical contractor on site daily, we had a controls contractor on site weekly. The second phase of the mechanical assessment was to clean, document, and repair every piece of equipment. So in our school systems, there's probably over 500 pieces of mechanical equipment, all the unit events in the classrooms, as well as rooftop and air delivery systems. The mechanical contractor has been able to write a deficiency report for each and every piece of equipment. So this is really an argue, arduous task. They have to go in there, they have to take apart the units, they have to repair belts, grease them and fix it all. It's been a great opportunity for the school so we know where we're at in terms of assessment and repairs so we can assure the community that things are in good shape. The um, second phase of that is the controls assessment. So all our mechanical equipment is controlled, automated. And in the DPW, we have an energy management system so we can see the daily temperatures of the spaces as well as knowing if equipment's failed or not. So again, the controls assessment and the mechanical assessments have been two, two, two phases, basically short-term repairs, which we're fixing as we find them as well as giving us the opportunity to do long-term capital assessment of what needs to be replaced. 
And that's a complicated process because I rely on all our professionals, our mechanical contractors to really do their due diligence and assess these systems to find out how we can, how I can present that to the town manager, the finance committee, so we know long-term where we're at. The final part of phase two was a testing and balancing contractor who came into every single, or that's about 50% complete, who's come into every single space, educational space, um, <clears throat> and verified the ventilation according to today's ASHRAE 62.2 standards. So when that's all done, we can assure the community, parents, student, teachers that they're getting proper ventilation. The one thing that we might have to deal with, we haven't yet, is thermal comfort issues because we're passing so much air through the classrooms and the system. The last and final part, again, as, as, as I spoke previously, is really capital planning. This is an extraordinary and exceptional opportunity for, for me and my department to really assess where we're at with HVAC equipment. And um, for the community, where we are going forward and the opportunity just to plan it and plan for the, the finance and the expense is, it's, it's really, you know, it came out of a, a bad reason, you know, COVID pushed us into this project, but I think the end result's gonna be very positive. So thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, it's Paul Cohen. You, you might want to know what kind of money are we talking about here and how are we going to pay for it? Um, I'll ask Kathleen to talk about how much money we're estimating and I'll tell you how we're going to pay for it, <laughs> which so, is the good news. Yeah. Um, so today we've spent a little over half a million dollars, uh, well above and beyond my budget. And the high cost estimate is about $1.2 million. I'm in the process though, as uh, Paul and I met last week and Gary, and we spoke about where we're gonna be with the capital and, and the bigger mechanical equipment. So I, I should know that number in a, um, two to four weeks because they're just finalizing doing the preventative maintenance survey on the rooftop units at the high school. All right, and in terms of the uh, funding piece, how are we gonna pay for it? It appears we, we may not even have to take action under this article at town meeting. And the reason for that is based on what, was, what happened this afternoon when President Biden signed the American Recovery and Relief Act, or whatever its formal name is into law, the town of Chelmsford as well as communities across the Commonwealth and across the nation are gonna receive significant funding from the federal government to address issues such as HVAC repairs and school buildings and so forth. Um, the, the money that this project costs, which could be around 1.2 million plus what have you, uh, will, will not be a concern based upon the preliminary estimates that we're seeing out there. Um, so I wanna assure the finance committee and the community that we're not at any financial risk here. Again, we, we made a professional judgment you know, early on in the COVID crisis with, you know, back months ago, as we said, it was the partnership as Kathleen described with the, with the school committee and input from the board of select board, you know, the superintendent of schools, the school facility manager, our, our you know, people such as Kathleen and Gary and so forth, um, you know, to, because we could see what was coming and, and I'm pleased to, to, to note that, you know, we, we, we're ahead of the game. Um, so, you know, we, we, with the legislation being signed today, money will come to the town of Chelmsford within 90 days, which will be prior to the end of this fiscal year. And, you know, obviously we'll track it and all that and the town account will report it because there is obviously transparency and accountability, but our, 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 our needs, you know, in funding costs will be met. But most importantly, as, we're, as we now know, the governor is mandating students return to school next month. And the important thing is that we can assure parents and students and educators in the community that the schools are a healthy environment um, for which to take place. And therefore, um, you know, we, we've, we've, we've met the goal and met the challenge. And again, you know, we're proactive and yes, took a bit of a risk, but we knew this was essential and had to be done because uh, as Gary Perschetti noted earlier, you know, we're dealing with school facilities that were constructed between 1959 and 1972. 
with seven buildings, uh, in, you know, including the including the Westlands building. Uh, and the good news is, is that you know we're 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 in good shape. Our, our test results show that that even with the hybrid model that's in place, we're not having spread in the schools, and we'll be well equipped and prepared for when the students come back. And as I said, the, the in terms of the taxpayer and the community, this this end up this cost will will be borne uh, by the um, federal funding that's coming, um, and therefore it, it's a good place. And as Kathleen noted. What you're going to see is the the money is going to be provided in two phases. The first in 90 days, as I described earlier, is 50 percent. And then the balance will be a year from now. And then the community will have until 2024 to expend these monies. So as Kathleen noted, the work we're doing now will be paid for and completed. And then we'll have the funding to do the capital requirements uh, that, are, that are necessary in the years ahead. So as Kathleen said, un, you know, unfortunately, this crisis brought this on. But the good news is, is going forward, even beyond the pandemic, and, and when we're dealing with regular seasonal flu and other, you know, just inhabitants of the building, we'll be in great shape. So um, it's great news. And again, um, I really want to commend everybody because this was a team effort. Um, and, and Kathleen and, and, and Dr. Lang and Gary and so forth, we've been given regular updates to the select board and school committee. And um, it's, it's really uh, been a great effort and something, you know, again, that we're really serving the community well. And, and again, the inhabitants of the school, meaning our children and the educators who are there on a daily basis. Any further questions? All right. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. All right. Moving along, we have the review of Artmore Article 10, which is the PFAS and groundwater monitoring wells of 54 Bridgerton Road. Yeah, so I can I can speak with that. We're we're just about to begin the um, our second phase uh, of this. the The first phase was done over the winter, which once we discovered um, in the test wells on the old highway. Um, yard site there at 54 Richardson Road. We did some sampling uh, three different occasions back in the fall into the early winter. Uh, had the PFAS at elevated levels higher than the, than the state limits. Um, so our initial step was to file uh, a plan with DEP, with the Bureau of Waste Site Cleanup. Um, that initial plan was approved with a few conditions. Uh, we had a little back and forth. We got final approval earlier this week. Uh, I did some actual, actually some investigating up there today. Uh, but next week we're gonna begin uh, drilling about 15 monitoring wells all around the site for additional sampling. Uh, and then also groundwater analysis, meaning you know the flow of the groundwater, how it's, because uh, if in case you don't know, uh, North Chelmsford Water District's wells are directly across the street uh, where they draw their drinking water, and they have uh, some some levels of the PFAS in their wells, not above limits, uh, but they have some. So uh, trying to identify the source, be it at the old highway site or be it a neighboring property, we uh, hope to figure that out here over the next uh, few months. Uh, this this sort of second phase monitoring phase that we're in will run until October. Uh, hopefully by then uh, we have series of samples have the full groundwater analysis and can then move on to uh, whatever the next phase may be after, you know, we find out um, fully what our results are gonna be here. So we've, we've gone into contract with uh, our LSP as well as drilling contractors and all that. And again, like I say, it's gonna start on Monday. So once we get findings from all this, so really know um, going forward, what are, you know, we should start narrowing it on additional costs um, that we could have for any kind of cleanup treatment or, you know, whatever else. And then uh, I guess we'll just, we can, Proceed from there. All right. 
Any questions? What are you expecting the cost of this first phase to be? So the, the first initial phase that was some some site investigation and filing the initial paperwork was uh, a little under 16,000. This next phase that we're beginning on Monday uh, with the sampling that runs through the summer and analysis that runs through the summer is $96,000 or a little over $96,000. And after that, um, depending, I think it'll be dependent on, on the findings. Any other questions? I'll say that this will be something going forward that we'll be seeing in the future. Yep. All right. All right, uh, moving along, we have a review of Warren Article 12, uh, the sewer vacuum truck. So the, this is, um, this was actually scheduled for next fiscal year um, in the, the, the sewer uh, capital plan. Uh, we made the decision back in the fall to, to move it up a year and to basically move the truck up a year and flip uh, a couple of uh, pump station improvements out a year because, as you know, in the, the past couple of years, we funded three different pump station improvements. We're actively working on two now. We still have one in the queue that's already funded. So in order to give us a little bit of time to kind of catch up on those and complete those projects, we thought it was a good idea to kind of, like I say, flip a couple, push them out a year, but then kind of pull the vector up. Uh, what this is going to do for us is is basically we have a vector now. It's a 2010. Uh, we're going to put that into reserve status, you know, emergency status, uh, and this this new truck uh, will be used, you know, um, for all operations uh, in an in an involved with all the wet well cleaning you know, line flushing, line, uh, manhole cleaning uh, that gets done based on our permitting with Lowell and the, and the uh, state and federal governments. Um, currently, our backup is is a contractor. So, you know, we have on-call services, so that will more or less eliminate the need for that. And Steve, what's the expected cost of this truck? Uh, the, uh, of course, I didn't bring that with me. Off the top of my head, I think the sewer truck was four hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. Okay. And what's the expected life of the, of, the, of that truck? Uh, back truck will get you 17, 18 years. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? What is the average yearly contractor cost that we're currently paying? Um, minus Southwell and Katrina, because those are the two largest stations uh, that require, you know, uh, more or less an 18 wheeler uh, for cleaning the wet wells. Uh, I believe that they they spend upwards of eighty thousand dollars annually uh, in contract uh, vac trucks for assistance in cleaning wet wells. So this should significantly reduce that. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, we'll hop right along to the next uh, article. Article uh, 13, uh, the sewer utility truck. Yes, um, that's a replacement of a 2011 with 164,000 miles on it. Uh, front end is in need of some serious work and we're just starting to have some motor issues with the vehicle. As you know, pretty much every vehicle in our division plows. Uh, during the winter. So these trucks have hard mileage um, and it is starting to show some body rot. So it would, it would be um, the next one in line and we want to get that done. So that's what it is. Okay. And do we have anticipated cost on this, Gary? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, 60,000. These are the utility bodies because they have to have all their tools in it for uh, service and pump stations. They're a little bit different than the average pickup. Of course. Yep. Any questions? All right. Moving along, we have Article 15, uh, Dunshire Drive Culverts. Yep, so um, this was something that uh, 
has been already permitted. Uh, we put it through with the, the state MVP program uh, that started a couple of years ago. Uh, this, we applied for the um, first round for funding. Uh, it was about $96,000. It was survey design uh, and all the environmental permitting for the two large culverts on Dunshire Drive. Both the, were in need of replacement. Um, if anyone on the committee remembers, uh, the state level folks came out, did the big uh, kind of kickoff show down there on Dunshire Drive. What a wonderful project. Uh, this is perfect for the program. Uh, they gave us, again, the, the design funding for roughly $96,000. Uh, we got all that permitted. We then went in for the next round for the construction funding. Uh, total total budget for the project, I believe, was a little over eight hundred thousand. That's total. That's total numbers that in, you know that number included some town in kind services and things. Um, and then we promptly didn't get funded by the state, uh, even though they said what a wonderful project it was. So we had to file an emergency order and do a do an emergency repair uh, on the downstream culvert. Uh, we did that. Uh, last fall, because quite honestly, we, we were to the point of closing the road. Uh, so we did that. Uh, so I know uh, the town engineer and, and sustainability manager had a call, I believe, yesterday um, with the people at the MVP program. We were, we were trying to resubmit. Uh, so there is still hope that we might get some funding from them uh, for this project. But uh, this article in front of you is a, a little bit of a scaled back project, uh, more focusing on the culvert replacements uh, and some auxiliary work right at the culverts, as opposed to the to the full project that was permitted. Uh, we will be able to do some of that in house, um, but in case we don't get uh, any additional funding from the state, uh, there is a there is a need to replace these culverts, and I wanted to make sure that we had a funding source available to us. Any questions? I guess uh, I do have a question. I'm sorry. So, did you say the amount of that? The what the on the Dunshield Drive? What was the amount expected amount? Five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand. And did we? What is the source of the the funds? So I this one, that, Yep. Uh, it's a it's a borrowing that will go into, and I'm sure uh, John or Paul, correct me if I say this wrong, but it's it's a borrowing that will go into the debt service in the stormwater budget. Okay. And I on the previous ones about the trucks, the vacuum truck and the uh, the other truck, uh, the source of the funding is also. What is the source of the funding on that? I'm sorry if I missed that. It's borrowing, yep. Kathleen, but it gets funded from the sewer enterprise fund. The debt service okay. is funded. Oh, it, which when Steve was going through the budget, he explained that he'd come back to them to talk about the debt service. Okay. That's I'm what that's sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah those, those are included in those numbers that we, that we saw earlier. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Hearing or seeing none. Uh, next is the review art, warrant article 16, the stormwater vacuum truck. Yeah, so again, to go back to the, to the original proposal from 2017, this is the last um, piece of equipment that we have not uh, purchased to date. Uh, this vehicle was identified through the master plan uh, as, you know, a vehicle, uh, as a, a, a tool of need, I guess, I don't know how else to say it, uh, to, to assist with um, cleaning culverts, cleaning, you know, uh, some catch basins that the regular clamshell can't get in. We have uh, many oil separators around town uh, that are an initial uh, phase of a drainage system, like behind the town offices, there's some, there's some at the library at our, our building of public works up at North Fire in the parking lot. 
Um, you know, those need to be cleaned annually. Um, currently, we don't have the ability to do that. We have to contract it. Uh, we, we don't have the ability to clean these culverts uh, adequately. Um, again, this vehicle was identified through that process as a vehicle of need. And just to, I'll, I'll say it now to avoid the question, but this is a totally different truck than the saw truck. It might look the same, uh, you know, from a hundred feet away, but it's a totally different truck. And this would be a clean truck, not a, a dirty truck, if you will, with, as one that's cleaning storage. So just as there should be a sewer separation between stormwater and, and sewer lines, there should be a separation between the trucks that are servicing them. Correct. What's the anticipated cost on this one, Steve? Uh, this is a little less. Uh, estimated cost on this was four hundred and thirty-five thousand. Okay. Same type of uh, shelf life, if you will. Correct. And that was shown in our in the depth service of the uh, of, of the storm. Yeah, the stormwater budget. Correct. Yeah. Any questions? All right, let's move right along. Uh, next is a jump to Article 31, which is the general bylaw amendment to the stormwater management. So I guess I'll ask the committee, um, I can give just a, a brief, you know, summary on what it is. Uh, I know Christina Papadopoulos, town engineer, is gonna be doing some presentations to other boards and committees. Uh, I, I would ask if you would like her to do the same presentation for you. Uh, probably be prudent. It's the the bylaw is pretty pretty intense. Um, I mean, the, the the gist of it is it's a requirement under the the federal permitting uh, that we have a a single stormwater bylaw. Currently, our bylaws are in general bylaws and zoning bylaws. We're kind of all over the place, so this kind of brings it into one spot. Um, again, I'll I'll defer to. Uh, to the committee if they would like her to come back at another meeting uh, with her presentation. I know she's presenting to conservation planning, the select board, um, maybe even board of health. Uh, she'd be perfectly willing to, to come speak with the finance committee and go through this. It's a, it's a fairly uh, intense bylaw, I guess. Or maybe, maybe that's not the right word, but it's-, it's um, Comprehensive. Yes, that's, that'd be a much better word than intense. <laughs> Yeah, we can, we can talk about that later, later, guys, um, but we might want to have her come in and speak on that. All right. So with that in mind, let's head along to uh, review of Warren Article 35, the Turnpike Road sidewalk easements. So the easements for Turnpike Road, um, it's, it's somewhat connected to the Kinlock apartments that were built uh, near the Turnpike and Warren Ave intersection. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, Evan Belansky was able to uh, secure a, I believe it was a housing choice grant for $225,000. Uh, we're using a lot of that money for design uh, of the sidewalk, uh, run basically from those new apartments all the way up to um, the traffic lights at uh, Turnpike and Bill Ricker Road and Golden Cove Road. Um, Based on that design, there'll be a few easements that are needed um, for the sidewalk installation, uh, either you know for grading or or the like. The design is is um, ongoing at the moment; uh, should be done shortly, uh, and then we'll be into conservation permitting because we have to cross River Meadow Brook there, right behind where Workers Credit Union is. So we're going to have a little bit of a, a boardwalk footbridge, um, but this is just a, a part of that process. So. Uh, the hope is uh, we have all our permitting in place and we can, we can, we can start construction um, this summer. Okay. This is just for the authority to go ahead and acquire through the select board, uh, the, sure. the, the, the method by which they acquire, whether it be by donation, uh, by, um, by purchase or by eminent domain claims uh, will be decided at that time. Correct. Okay. Any questions? All right, seeing and hearing none, we'll go along to Article 36, which is the Ledge Road and Dunstable Road intersection easement. 
Yeah, so this one here is is uh, sort of a placeholder. Um, there's still some discussions that need to go on um, if this project is going to go forward. Uh, my hope is to have a presentation here for one of the next few select board meetings. Um, well, I'm sure some people on the committee are aware there's, there's a significant amount of truck traffic coming down Ledge Road from the quarry operations up in there. And the thought was to maybe if we could uh, realign the end of Ledge Road at Dunstable to allow a left turn, uh, that maybe it would help alleviate some of the truck traffic coming back through town. Uh, in looking at it, I have a few uh, concept level uh, truck turn drawings uh, and I developed an easement plan uh, based on those. It takes roughly a um, little less than a third of the property on the corner there. It's a, it's a brand new home. Uh, and I have to basically realign the road right up to the house almost. Uh, so I need to do uh, further presentation to the select board to see how we want to proceed with this one. And again, that, that's more or less like a placeholder. Okay. Any questions? All right, seeing and hearing none, we'll move along to the final warrant article, uh, Article 42, street acceptances. Yep, and the street acceptances, again, it's just, it, we, we sort of took last year off with kind of the not being sure of, um, with the pandemic and things on, on what was gonna happen. Uh, so we just kind of let it sit for a year, but this is sort of our ongoing program of, of cleaning up roads in town that never uh, completed the process, I guess. So we just run through the process with these. They've all been roads in town for, for many, many years. Um, we developed the plans in house and we just bring it through the process. Uh, the final step in that, in that process is town meeting approval. And then we get them submitted to the state and that keeps our mileage inventory up so we can at least hopefully maintain a slice of the pie in the, in the chapter 90 um, funding. How many miles are we talking here? Uh, overall here, it's, it's just a little more than a mile um, with the, with these roads, uh, you know, uh, the small cut throughs or, or dead ends basically which is more or less what we're down to at this point. We've picked off some of the bigger chunks in the past, the Hunt Roads, Robin Hill Road, for instance, uh, where you can gain, you know, some mileage, but, you know, we're not gonna find millions of dollars. I hope is to just more or less maintain what we get, you know, that we get that 1.15 million a year. So, you know, when they release the 200 million overall. So our hope is to just maintain that piece of the pie. Okay. All right. Any questions? Do we do we have any idea about how many how many roads we have left? How much mileage we have left to go? Uh, the overall number of streets, I believe, if you know, assuming that these seven uh, get accepted, uh, I believe the overall number is under twenty at this point, uh, and they're all small oddballs. Uh, there are a couple that we'll have to take you know a little bit of harder consideration. Um, up in the backside of Freeman Lake, you know, some of the old camp roads, things like that. So we'll have to, you know, they might need more of a kind of a combination betterment program, capital improvement thing. We did it 20 years ago, Willis Drive on the other side of Freeman Lake. We did a betterment program, accepted those in there, Willis 12th, 13th Ave, down around in there. So it might be the same type of thing, but we're kind of, you know, picking off some of the, some of the ones that are a little bit easier and then, you know, leave the hard ones for last, I guess. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you all very much for being here this evening. I think that Thank concludes you. the Warren Articles for DBW and uh, uh, we'll reach out uh, regarding uh, the, the zoning zoning article. I'm sorry, the um, bylaw the article. Bylaw. Yep, perfect. Um, sure. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, next on our agenda this evening, uh, we have a review of the fiscal year 22 Neshoba Valley Technical School District budget. And with us this evening, we have uh, the superintendent, uh, Denise Pigeon, the business manager, Michelle Shepard, 
and uh, members of the Neshoba Valley Technical School District School Committee from Chelmsford. Good evening. Good evening. Is it okay if I share, can you hear me? I, yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank All you. Right, let me, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grant you access. Hold on one second. You should be able to share now. Okay, I'm just confirming that you can all see my slideshow. We can. Great. Thank you for the invite to come here tonight and talk to you about the FY22 budget for Neshoba Tech. Um, before we get into the, the numbers of the budget, I just wanted to show you a few images of what learning looks like at Neshoba Tech this year. Certainly been a year like no other. Um, you likely know that this year we did start off the school year and we have been functioning in a hybrid model since September. Uh, when we designed our hybrid model, we really focused on making sure the students were in-person learning on their technical week uh, because during the mandatory shutdown, that was absolutely the most difficult aspect of doing what we do at Neshoba Tech and trying to teach remotely in the technical programs. So in order to do that, we repurposed all of our spaces. These pictures are actually the cafeteria and this is our electrical program, which has flexed into the cafeteria so that all of our students could continue to learn um, full-time on their technical week. So um, all year long on their shop week, students have been in person full-time and on their academic week, they have been studying remotely uh, with the exception of our high needs special ed students have been um, functioning full-time on both academic and technical week. Just a few other pictures. Um, again, you know, the, the same that you've heard from Transfer Public Schools, just a different setup. Um, we are very pleased that we've also been able to offer athletics um, in every season with all the modifications in place. So we've been doing our best to provide as, as normal of an, of an opportunity to students as possible during some very unprecedented times. I um, have to just make a special thank you to our, our school health nurses, um, Pat and Kate. Kate's actually a, a staff member we brought on this school year, which you'll actually see her position reflected in our FY22 proposed budget. Um, prior to this year, we actually had only one school nurse, which we knew we could not make work in, in these current times. So we brought Kate on board. And I also want to um, echo what I heard earlier this evening about Sue Rosa. We really couldn't have done it without her. She has been a fabulous support to our school system. And we just wanna say thank you. She's been on speed dial anytime I've needed her. Um, what a wonderful, wonderful resource. Some capital projects that have been underway. I'm very pleased that we finally finished the dental and health project that we had started pre-closure. Students did quite a bit of the work in there. You see the photo on the right, students doing the work. Um, and then the picture on the left is the, is the sort of the finished product. Um, all of the equipment for that particular upgrade was through a workforce skills capital grant that we received. We're also in the midst of doing a server virtualization project. Um, we have our students working on some lighting system upgrades and changing out sensors. We've also this year done quite a few other building modifications to support reopening, such as putting um, gates on the outside of our garage doors for our technical program areas to increase ventilation. And this spring, we have some work planned for fire suppression systems and our um, curbing, et cetera. In terms of enrollment, um, we are doing very well. Our enrollment compared to last year is an increase of 13 district students overall, a slight decline in school choice and a slight increase in non-resident, but our overall district enrollment increase of 13. Looking at it broken down by town, um, Chelmsford's enrollment has increased by 12 students. In terms of an enrollment history from Chelmsford, again, 12 student increase from last year. Um, of note, I just want to let you know that last year you had four postgrads. This year there are two. In terms of the budget, um, as you know, we do have a 14 member school committee. Um, because we have such a large board, we also do a lot of our work in subcommittee. And this year, three of your Chumsford representatives are serving on our budget and finance subcommittee. Um, that's Dawn, Claire, and Lawrence. They've been very instrumental in the development of this budget that you will see today. Um, and Sam, who I know is here tonight as well, also serves on our curriculum subcommittee. In terms of planning the FY22 budget, um, we were 
moving forward with planning for a regular reopening, obviously with whatever COVID restrictions are, are required as we move into next school year. We are hopeful to leverage other, other COVID-19 related funds that, that may be coming forward for any um, additional costs we may experience as we move forward from, from the pandemic. And the other piece going into the FY22 budget development, just wanna share with you that um, at the end of last year, our teachers union and all of our other units, um, including the, the leadership team, all agreed to a staff-wide 0% increase in salary to support um, what we knew were, were challenging times with the budget. The FY22 budget does have some staffing increases. Um, again, the full-time nurse position that I mentioned to you earlier um, we have increased, we have just one part-time social worker and in, we are increasing that social worker's position from a 0.4 to a full-time. And we're increasing a part-time assistant business manager position to full-time. In terms of capital planning, we did level fund um, our capital planning budget for next year. And we're working on a lot of the same things that we've been working on over the last few years. We also plan to continue moving forward with our technical program renovation cycle. We have another um, grant application out there, this time focused on plumbing, which we're hopeful that we might receive some additional workforce skills capital grants. And we're also um, hopeful to upgrade some cosmetology that cabinetry needs some work from non-resident tuition funding. Um, just other updates that I'd like to give you, our stabilization account, this budget does not fund stabilization. Um, it is, it is um, at our current goal, so we're not funding. OPEB, we're continuing to move forward the proposed contribution of 200,000 this year. Um, this is the bird's eye view of the budget um, in terms of, of by function code or, gen or general expense. Um, the biggest changes are actually go over on the next slide, uh, but if you look to the bottom, our overall expense increase is $377,957 or a 2.42% increase over last year. This slide shows you the major changes, which I've already mentioned to you, the increase in the business manager, um, the increase in the social worker FTE, the school nurse, other transportation increases with our contract and some special transportation needs, um, et cetera. This slide is an overview of our revenue. Um, and I know this is a story that we've talked about in previous meetings this year, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but again, as you know, direct funding from the state, um, our increase was only $390 this year. We're um, expecting potentially slightly less in transportation reimbursement. Um, of note, this is continuing our practice of using 100% of our certified excess and deficiency. Although this was a, a number that is actually under the 5%, so we're not required to put it towards our assessment. It's always been Shoba's um, practice to put 100% towards the budget. And then continuing with, with utilizing school choice to offset the costs. Um, oops, sorry, I went too fast. On the bottom is the, um, the amount that would, would come for revenue from the assessment, which is broken down a little bit deeper on another slide. Again, the bird's eye view of the total budget, 2.42% increase, and then the total revenue. Um, of note, again, this is not a, a story that we haven't spoken about before, but the direct revenue from the state declining. And unfortunately, that means that more revenue is coming from member towns. And then what happens, we, we build out the assessment based on the information that comes out on the governor's budget. So the town's minimum contribution, this is all established through the formula. So these are not numbers that, that we calculate. This is a number that's calculated through the formula and the rest of the formula does work itself out based on the student enrollment. So Chelm, oops, too fast. Um, Chelmsford has experienced an increase mostly due to the change of student enrollment, which is the 12 additional students. Your overall student percentage of, of enrollment at Neshoba Tech has gone up by 1.2%. The biggest increase is actually in the town's required minimum contribution, which is changes in the state formula for a total increase of $276,207 over the assessment from last year. Um, it's my understanding it came in just under um, what Paul Cohen had estimated in the budget. Last slide, I just wanna say thank you to our cooperative placement business partners. Many of these are actually located in Chelmsford and nearby towns. Um, they've been hiring our students all along and um, straight through the pandemic, many of our students were out at work 
um, even, even during closure. So I just wanted to end with a thank you to our business partners. They're very instrumental in the education that we provide at Neshoba Tech. Thank you. I, I have two quick questions. Can, sure. can you hear me or are we okay? Yeah. Uh, just quickly back to your excess and deficiency account. So the $640,000 put towards the budget, that zero out your excess and deficiency or is there some balance still in there? That uses all of it. Okay, thank you. And I just wanted to ask in general, um, you know the, the summary page that you have that shows by category the, you know, what you spent? Did, did you do that with including to actual, comparing it to actual? I didn't see that this year. In the, in the past, we've been getting um, kind of that summary sheet and showing this is what was budgeted and this is what the actual. Did you provide us with that this year or did you calculate That's it? No, that's a great question, Kathy. Thank you. Um, I think I did send the budget over budget when I emailed Jim, um, but I did post the actual to budget in our um, on our webpage under documents. I can show you where that where that is. is. Am I still screen sharing? So you'll be able to see. You are. If you um, if you go to Neshoba Tech's website and you yeah. click on yeah. documents right here, and you go to budget, I did under proposed documents for public hearing i did load up the comparison with the actuals i in case okay, I didn't thank you for that so it is in there i i just i think that that is a um i like that i like i really like to see what was um Absolutely. what was proposed and what you actually spent by category and i appreciate the effort that awesome. um that entails thank you I guess I have one philosophical question to ask. I noticed that um, one, one town's enrollment went down by quite a few students. Um, why, why do you think that is? Do you think, like, is there a, is something happening within the market that makes your school a bigger draw from one community to another? What's your analysis of that? That's another great question. Um, we did have a sharp decline in the in a couple of our towns, Pepperell in particular this year. Um, I think it's an anomaly for, for that particular year. And the reason I say that is because their applications have already doubled for the incoming freshman class. So I do think you're gonna see our the second largest town Pepperell is going to spike back up next year. Um, we actually had a pretty, pretty lengthy conversation about it with their finance committee because their assessment's actually going down this year. Um, but I would anticipate that based on the enrollment balancing back, their assessment is going to go significantly up again next year. So we were working through uh, making sure that we could plan for that. Um, I, in terms of, of why one town may send more students than another, um, I think it varies from town to town. We do our very best to make sure that every student has an awareness of Neshoba Tech because we are their other public high school. We are here to provide the high quality vocational, technical, and academic education. Um, some of our schools are incredibly supportive. Some of our towns are incredibly supportive with making sure we're all working together to get the word out. Um, in other towns, I think we could all work together to make sure we're reaching all students so that they know that we are here for them. Yeah, yeah Mr. Chairman, it's, it's Tom Andrew Paulcon. If I may interject, Kathleen, you may see that in Chelmsford next year. For whatever reason, there's an abnormally small eighth grade class in Chelmsford this year, and so I would expect that the enrollment in the freshman, at both at the high school and in Showa Tech will get out significantly next year. So it could just be, like you said, these anomalies that happen just, you know, in communities. Yeah, because the other reason we've seen in the past has been an opening of another of another school district or a transfer district or closing a district. I don't think that's occurred this year. So I, I, the anomaly does make sense, uh, at least as a, as a potential uh, reason as to why that's happening. Thank you. We have any other questions? All right, seeing and hearing none. I'd like to thank you all for being here this evening. Um, as we do, and as we have in the past, we'll certainly let you know when we're reviewing uh, for our recommendations uh, so that you're aware of that evening. 
um, as we've done the last couple of years. Uh, and we appreciate all the work you've put into this and then all, all the work you've put in this year as a, as a school system uh, during this the very difficult um, pandemic season. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next on our agenda this evening, we have the review of the fiscal year 22 budget for the Chelsea Public Schools. And with us this evening, we have uh, Jay Langer, Superintendent, uh, Joanna Johnson M. Collins, uh, our Director of Business and Finance, and members of the Chelsea School Committee. Good evening. Hi, good evening. How are you? Good. Yourself? Couldn't be better. Thank you. <laughs> would you like to uh, be able to share your screen or would you like me to put up your uh, presentation? How would you like to proceed? Um, it's totally up to you. Uh, I didn't have it pulled up on the um, computer that I'm working from. I figured I would just walk you through some of the, uh, the highlights of the uh, budget for the year. And uh, we had talked with the um, subcommittee, the finance committee about a week or so uh, back and I uh, had reviewed the, uh, the budget with them. So it's, it's uh, totally up to you with regard to how you want me to proceed. Uh, why don't I do this? Uh, I'm gonna open up what I have here. And then to the extent that you would like to use it, you can certainly let me know. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, if, if you wanted to um, open it up to just page 11, uh, that's kind of the highlight section. There's just some bullets I can walk you through that. Okay, just give me one second while, while I locate that particular one. And while my computer thinks. I mean, if it's easy for you, I, I mean, I can pull it up if you, Oh, no, I, I have it here. It's just a matter of switching okay. over. Great, thank you. Is it page 11? Yeah, if we just jump to page 11, um, that's kind of the overarching highlights, uh, kind of gives that, yep, back a little bit, uh, kind of gives just the overview uh, for the school year for you. Um, our, you know, the Chelmsford Public Schools uh, fiscal 22 budget um, basically is a, a level service budget as we go through the various uh, pages. I know over the last number of years, we've actually added some pretty significant programming to the district. We've added a number of different staff positions to support the different programs that we've added. Uh, but this year is actually a, a, just a pretty straightforward uh, level service budget. Um, we're not proposing any increases in staff. Um, this has been, uh, as you know, Denise was mentioning earlier, kind of a crazy school year for everyone, uh, just with the pandemic and whatnot um, from our switch last spring to having to go fully remote to this year, um, kind of straddling between um, hybrid options for students as well as fully remote options for students. Uh, we are gonna be transitioning in April to uh, full in-person learning for those uh, individuals that would uh, like it. Very sorry about that. <laughs> Again, sorry about that. Uh, so we're going to be transitioning to uh, full in-person learning for students in the elementary and the middle school level that would like it. Uh, in April, we just sent a notice out to parents uh, this afternoon for them to make some selections. And then we're gearing up for uh, what we anticipate at this point will be a full return to a more normal school year in the fall. Um, what A couple of things we did uh, incorporate into the budget for next year. It is a $65 million uh, base operating budget. Um, we were very fortunate, actually, prior to the pandemic that we had settled all of our employee uh, contracts. So all of our different employee agreements are in place for July 1st. So we're very easily um, able to incorporate the steps and lane changes in the uh, budget for next year. Um, we do have a number of retirements. We have about 15 to 16 teachers who are going to be retiring this year. Um, so we always budget those retirements at a master step three. That is traditionally a pretty good uh, average for us for what the replacement costs of new um, staff coming in. 
Um, one of the things that I did uh, bump up a little bit uh, within the budget was we know that coming back in the uh, fall, we're gonna have some students that have some pretty significant learning loss that we're gonna need to um, try to remedy and catch up on. So we did uh, augment a little bit our uh, tutoring and interventionist uh, line items. Um, these aren't you know, full-time positions, the more hourly type uh, employees. Sometimes we'll try to uh, recruit uh, retired teachers, things along those lines. Um, licensed uh, individuals who can go in and provide some direct instruction to students who might be struggling and need a little bit of help um, to catch up. So we did incorporate that into the budget, but it doesn't add any um, FTEs. Um, on the third bullet uh, on this particular page, uh, thanks Jim for, for forwarding, um, we are continuing with our 101 computer initiative next year. This has been, um, and you know, thank gosh, we actually started it uh, two years ago, just given the uh, situation we found ourselves in this year. Uh, but we're going to be adding another uh, two grade levels. So the incoming fifth and ninth grade students to the district will be provided with their own district issued uh, Chromebook to use. Again, they keep the device for four years. They turn it over as they go from middle school to high school, they get a new device. And then at the end of the uh, four years, it's probably, uh, it's, it's uh, just about used up its life. But we have been able to uh, fund that initiative um, through the school choice revolving fund. So we haven't had to really impact the local budget for that. Um, that's a sustainable source of revenue for us. And um, after next year, we're actually going to be on a cycle where uh, basically every student in our district grades five to 12 um, will have a district issued device. And what that's allowing us to do is relocate the devices that are currently at the middle of the high school that might be on carts uh, down to the elementary school so that almost every classroom in the fall uh, will have their own card of devices. Uh, the kids in the elementary grade levels don't bring them back and forth uh, home, but whenever they're in school, they can actually access a device if the teacher is working on some type of a um, technological instructional um, lesson. Um, one other uh, bullet here, the last bullet, we did just streamline our uh, fee structure for our uh, clubs at the high school and the middle school level. Um, over the last couple of years, we've made a couple of um, reductions. They're not significant financially, uh, but we're just trying to line up our programs um, level to level. So uh, currently we have a $50 per year student activity fee at the middle schools and uh, the high school is at 100. So we were able to uh, work the budget to bring the high school activity fee down to 50 as well. Um, so next year we'll have some parity and symmetry between the middle school fee being at 50, the high school fee being at 50. And uh, I don't see it really, I won't be recommending it likely go less than that. I think it is important that we have some buy-in from the students to participate in those clubs. And I think $50 for a year of a uh, club activity is a, a reasonable price, uh, but we're happy to at least be able to bring that into um, uh, alignment with the uh, middle schools for next year. Uh, throughout the budget document, we've continued to utilize uh, circuit breaker funding. Again, school choice funding I mentioned earlier uh, incorporates and pays for the 101 computer, um, computer initiative. We use a revolving fund from CHIPS to offset some of the revenues that are um, derived from that particular program. And uh, again, before you this evening is a pretty, uh, pretty basic um, level service budget from fiscal 21 to fiscal 22. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions any individuals may um, have. Um, again, in previous years, we've actually had more things to talk about with regard to new programming and staffing, um, but this is a pretty um, level service budget year over year. All right, do you have any questions? For the, uh, the retiring teachers that you mentioned that you kind of use the average of 62,000 for the onboarding, the replacements, what's, what's the average of the ones that are retiring, like ballpark? Like, I'm assuming they're maxed out on the scale. Yeah, um, I'd have to look. I mean, anyone that's retiring for the most part is on the top step um, of the uh, salary scale. So what I end up doing is taking that, um, you know, whatever the delta is between that top number um, for argument's sake, let's say it's, you know, 75,000 compared to uh, the master step three. And uh, I already assume that reduction as we're going through the, um, through the budget. So when I develop the staff salary book, we're putting in the lesser salary, the master step three salary, we're not carrying the higher salary. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think you had a question. Yeah, I couldn't find my unmute button. Thank you. Um, Jay, I just had a couple of questions um, relating to heading back to school. So oh. one of the things was there was a, a survey put out for pool testing about how many percentages of families have signed up for it. Hmm. Um, 
you know what, give, if you give me one second, because I was actually looking at it um, this afternoon, we are going to be um, offering voluntary um, COVID pool testing to any staff or students in the district. Um, so we did put a um, Google form out. Let me just get you the latest numbers. It's ballpark a thousand so far have signed up, but I can get you the exact um, if you'd like. And then do you know what the expected cost is gonna be? Sure, well, I'm pulling that up. I can uh, look for you. The um, cost of the program, the state is actually picking up for the first um, six weeks at least. Um, so any of the costs associated with running the test themselves, um, we have been assigned a company that's gonna work with us to help with the, um, the specimen collection of the schools and um, the uh, marking of all the different uh, test files, the courier service that has to bring the test to Cambridge, so there is um, some pretty significant cost behind that. Um, I want to say, you know, if we had about a thousand um, students participating, students and staff on a weekly basis, it would probably run us in the ballpark of between ten and twelve thousand dollars per week um, to be running that uh, testing. And again, we are just kind of waiting to see exactly how long the uh, state is going to pay for the program for us. We know it's going to be at least. I just want to put it out there. He did not bark for the first two hours of the meeting when we were going through all the different uh, warrant articles or anything. As soon as I get on and have to unmute the, un unmute the mic, he goes crazy. because well, you're so talking. I apologize. Uh, yeah. You know what, he, it's this time of night, all the neighbors take the dogs out and he sees the dogs outside going for their walks and he just goes out of his mind. Um, but I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. So. Um, so I would say 10 to 12,000 per week if we had the current uh, numbers in the program. The state is picking up the tab through the end of April. So we would be looking at, you know, it would be under $100,000 I would estimate between now and the end of the school year. And the ESSER money that we're receiving from uh, DESE uh, is uh, gonna pay for that. So it is an allowable expense under that grant. I have a feeling uh, based on the um, SR2, which is gonna be coming out, as well as that new federal uh, stimulus package, there was a lot of money in that for COVID testing. I have a feeling the state's uh, gonna step up and actually probably pick up the cost for the end of the school year. And we'll just be looking at what the cost for the start of next year are gonna be. Um, but you know, I think you know, if we get that kind of participation, obviously we made the announcement uh, today based on the Board of Ed's uh, decision last week to bring everyone back to school in person. It's one of our mitigation strategies to really make people feel comfortable um, in the buildings. I think, you know, one of them also is obviously we've done a lot of work with, um, you know, social distancing and hand hygiene and uh, whatnot all throughout the course of the uh, fall. Our teachers, you know, thank goodness are able to now receive a uh, vaccine. So that's gonna help them uh, feel a little bit more comfortable in the classrooms. The pool testing is just another mitigation strategy that I think is gonna help uh, keep us in school, keep uh, staff and students healthy. Uh, so I do think it's worth it um, financially. And again, I am happy that the SM money will pay for it if the state doesn't pick up the tab. And then we'll just have to see what the cost is for, um, for next fall. And then, thank you. And then um, what about the fact that we're, uh, we have to reopen in, in less than a month elementary schools and a little over a month the middle schools? What's the expected cost for that? Um, I'm hearing that we might have to buy desks for, for like the cafeterias and things like that. Yep, no, that's true. Uh, we had a crazy day. Uh, we actually had a crazy week uh, since last Friday when that news came out that um, we were going to have to move everyone back in a little bit earlier than we wanted. Um, we had actually um, kind of prepared ourselves for a staggered re-entry. I did see us getting all fully back in person before the end of the school year, just not quite on the timeline that the commissioner has um, required districts to adhere to. So at this point in time, all uh, elementary school students uh, technically grades K to five. However, uh, because of our grade level configuration on the schools, I'm petitioning for just our elementary kids grades K to four uh, to go back on Monday, April 5th. And then our middle school students uh, would be required to go back on Wednesday, the 28th after the vacation. I'm petitioning to have the fifth grade be included with the middle school, just because that's the way our schools are aligned and not to have one particular grade level go in on April 5th and everyone else go in uh, after the vacation. There's a lot of scheduling logistics that take place. Um, one of the things that we are gonna have to do is uh, reduce some of our distancing within classrooms. We're not able to adhere to a six foot distancing and get all the kids uh, back into rooms. So we are gonna have to go down to 
um, the minimum being three. If we can eke out a little bit more room to room, we'll certainly try to, but the minimum distance would be uh, three. To do that at the elementary school level in particular, um, K1 and two uses a lot of tables instead of actually students having their own desks. Um, so we are gonna have to uh, replace uh, desks at that level. Uh, we we're able to work with a couple of vendors and actually got an order in uh, yesterday. Uh, it might've been finalized this morning, but we were able to commit to the uh, desk order uh, today. I would say, um, you know, overall between the desks and the chairs and whatnot, um, they're certainly not gonna go to waste. What we'll use once this is over, we'll replenish some of the upper elementary and the middle school furniture that uh, usually would be on a re replacement cycle. We bought desks that are adjustable. So the legs will adjust, um, you know, from elementary um, age or size all the way up to the middle school size. So we'll certainly make good use of them. But it's gonna cost us in the ballpark, if I'd say $150,000 between the uh, desks and chairs that we need, as well as we're purchasing, not purchasing, I'm sorry, um, renting some outdoor tents uh, for the buildings, uh, just so that we can actually open up some additional outdoor spaces for lunch or uh, breaks and things along those lines in the event of the climate weather, if it starts getting really hot in June, uh, just to have some shaded areas outside where the kids can go and separate a little bit and take their masks up and have breaks and lunches and whatnot. So ballpark, it's about $150,000 combined when you look at the desks and chairs and tents and whatnot. Um, there'll be other little costs, uh, again, going forward. Um, the, you know, the only you know, technical kind of lost cost will be the, uh, the tents because obviously we're not gonna buy them, we're just gonna rent them. You know, that's going to, in the end, be somewhere in the $20,000 ballpark. Um, the rest of the desks and chairs, again, we'll certainly use. We'll just repurpose them for the district. And then we won't have to be quite as aggressive on our replacement uh, plan for uh, all the furniture at the upper elementary and middle schools in the years to come. Where, where are you anticipating getting the $150,000 from for that? Uh, well, right now we're just going to tag our, our ESSER money uh, because we do have the ESSER money, which will uh, provide for that. So that is the fund that we're uh, cutting the purchase orders against. Um, as we're going through our, uh, we'll do a third quarter projection at the end of March. Uh, we do have excess um, revenue in our budget for fiscal 21. We may end up um, recommending the school committee consider a transfer of local funds um, to pay for those desks, which will then allow us to uh, basically reimburse the ESSER fund because the ESSER fund will run for fiscal 22 and fiscal 23. So we may want to move that money uh, out another year or two because we still don't 100% know what we're going to be dealing with when we get everyone back to a full in-person scenario as far as services, uh, both academic supports and behavioral and therapeutic services we may need for kids. So I'd like to have a little bit of wiggle room and budgeting uh, for fiscal 22 and 23 to be able to respond to some of the needs that are gonna develop once uh, we get everyone back in person. But for the time being, we have the ESSER funds to be able to um, to cover us if we had to. Thank you. And there's a, just one other question. Um, I know it, it's come up and um, it's been discussed here and there that uh, starting in the fall, uh, the middle schools will have a new standard-based report card system. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, a cost this past year for um, like the teacher PD? And then is there a cost to implement it next year in the budget? Um, there's no additional cost within the budget itself. Um, there's no cost for, you know, the current year we're in or even next year as far as PD. It's all uh, department and school based. Um, so it's all time that would already be built into the, um, to the schedule or to the system. There's no cost for that front. Anytime we do any type of um, tweaking, whether it's a report card or an attendance report, or if we wanted to do um, some kind of a different um, academic report coming out of our computer system, uh, you do have to pay the company for any kind of modified um, reporting uh, mechanisms that come out of X2 is our student database system. Um, so there would be costs associated with um, that. I don't know off the top of my head exactly what it was or what it is, but uh, it'd be money that's included already within the budget. It wouldn't be a like an add-on or anything like that cost-wise. Okay, so the curriculum isn't going to get overhauled, so it's not going to be a large expense. No, the curriculum itself is not changing. Um, and the schools are really just looking at the way, um, again, the, the, the frameworks and our, our case and guides, uh, curriculum, whatnot, um, is aligned. I know the schools have been doing a lot of work this year in their assessments and just making sure the assessments are aligned to the standards. And then, you know, kind of a next natural step is to have the um, reporting out of the assessments and the standards uh, be in a different format. 
Uh, we are looking at a couple of different options right now. So there is still in play a little bit. Um, we will be doing a little update for the school committee uh, next Tuesday. So I, I do know people are interested in that. Um, that would definitely be something to peek at. And then we will have a little update in the uh, school committee packet this weekend um, with the results of the parent survey. And again, just the uh, direction that uh, we're going to be going in for the fall. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? I do. Uh, Dr. Lane, do you look forward to or, or see any additional costs for additional busing now that we're returning back to school? Um, I don't see that for this year. Um, it, it just would not be um, feasible to be able to consider adding any buses at this point in the year for the last you know, eight to 10 weeks. Um, we already have our full complement of buses uh, that if we were running during a regular school year, I believe it's 29 buses that we have under contract that we will be using. Um, they're obviously not at capacity right now because of the, the, um, the regulations at the beginning of the year about how many students you could have on a bus and where they had to be situated on the bus. They've uh, reduced those uh, regulations a little bit over the last couple of weeks, so we're still um, reviewing that. As a district, what we uh, did do this past fall is we decided to forego the, um, the fee for parents to ride the bus. Uh, because again, on any given day, with only having half a cohort in school, we had less than half ridership on the buses. We were also able to uh, decrease the, um, the perimeter where people would qualify for the bus to anything over a mile uh, from the schools in grades um, K at the elementary level through eight. Um, so what I anticipate doing at this point in time, uh, we do have the capacity on the existing buses, on the existing runs to add both cohorts together under the new DESE guidelines where you can accommodate more students on a bus. We're also going into the good weather, um, which is helpful for us because we can leave bus windows open and whatnot. The winter was very difficult. It would have been hard to do this then. Um, but I see us uh, being able to basically uh, transport everyone that we're transporting now, which is the elementary and middle schools, anyone a mile from the school. What I don't think we're going to be able to do, and I'm still, again, this is very new to us, we're still kind of running the numbers, is we traditionally allow students who live um, below the mileage to pay a fee to still ride the bus. I don't think I'm going to have capacity to allow people under a mile to kind of purchase a a ticket or be able to ride the bus for free, um, just capacity wise. And I don't know that we really have the, um, the ability at this point with again, just eight to 10 weeks of school left to um, up and redo all of the bus routes and the whole you know logistics that go with that. Um, but you know, Joanna in our business office and Peter, our transportation coordinator are analyzing that all right now. Um, we're very much going to try to get as many students on the buses as we possibly can um, under the guidelines. Uh, I'm pretty, you know, 99% confident we'll be able to take care of people we're currently transporting who have a bus or even our remote families that move from remote to in-person as long as they're over the mile. I, I just realistically don't think we're going to get under a mile for this spring um, and we'll have to reassess everything for the fall. And I may have missed it if I did. I'm sorry. Are you saying that there's no accommodations for high school students whatsoever? Oh, no, at the, um, no, it was just a little bit different. I was talking K to eight. At the uh, high school level, what we ended up doing this year, uh, because the school times had all changed uh, on us, and we really needed the bus flexibility for the middle school, which is our second tier. Right now, we operate our buses on three tiers. So there's a high school run first thing in the morning, then a middle school run, and then an elementary school run. We didn't have uh, the time within the schedule to be able to run the traditional bus stops that we would to say the students home or the tops of streets at the high school. So we identified a number of different uh, locations on the outskirts of town um, that we, we basically have a shuttle run. Um, so students, you know, within in the neighborhood, if they need a bus, uh, again, these are the students that live a little further away from the high school. Um, they can uh, go to any of the shuttle run stops that are close to their home, jump on the bus, and it's just a direct ride to the high school. Um, it doesn't kind of travel through the neighborhoods like it traditionally would to pick up kids. Uh, so the students do have to get to the shuttle stop. And at the end of the day, that's where they're also, um, um, they depart the bus. So they ride the bus from the high school back to the location of where the, the drop is. Um, so we are still going to have that for the high school kids. I don't know, again, just looking at the, um, the numbers, if we're going to be able to add a few stops or based on where the, the riders are coming from, um, you know, if we can either combine or, you know, move routes slightly, but I just don't have a lot of capacity um, to be adding like the traditional, um, 
not door to door, but the traditional, you know, kind of street to street transportation uh, for the high school kids for the eight to 10 weeks at the end of the school year. I think we'll go back to a more traditional um, school transportation runs and, and whatnot in the fall. Thank you, sir. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question. You had said that in the fall, you'll be evaluating programs for students that perhaps uh, need a, an educational boost because of uh, learning loss this year. Uh, is there any thought to like summer academic programs or? Yeah, we <clears throat> no, we definitely have um, thought about that. There's a little group that's convening to um, to talk about that and just what might it uh, look like, uh, not like a boot camp, but like some type of a little kind of refresher program in the summer, or even some type of a program to kind of get the kids geared uh, geared back up again for school in the fall if it was a little bit later. We do know that the um, again the ESSA funds and even some of the school reopening funds uh, that a grant der derived would actually provide for that. Um, we also have to just balance, and again, one of the things we're going to do is survey the staff to just kind of see where they're at, uh, because this has been a very difficult and long year for the staff as well, and I would just need to make sure that the staff, um, you know, would be looking for a summer opportunity. I don't want to get the hopes of all the kids and the families up uh, and then not have the capacity staffing-wise to staff it if the staff kind of need a break from uh, everything that's happened this year. But uh, no, it's, Kathy, it's absolutely a possibility. Um, and you know, what we would do if we uh, did that is obviously even like this year in phases, we would target like some of our most struggling and most needy students um, for the program. And then ideally open up seats as we uh, go based on um, availability of staff and even different levels might have a slightly different um, um, program. Thank you. Uh, and kudos to the entire staff for um living through this and taking such good care of the Chelmsford students. Um, I sincerely hope everyone's effort is appreciated because I'm sure it's been a grueling year. Um, I just wanted to ask one question. I don't even know if this information could be revealed. It, it goes to like, so the teachers or educators can now get the vaccine and there's, you know, I don't know what the loops they have to, hoops they have to jump through, but um, can you say like what percentage of staff is vaccinated? I mean, or is that, or plan to be vaccinated or is that uh, public data in any way or not? I don't know if that would make parents feel more reassured or the staff reassured. I don't know. Is, can you reveal the percentage or could it be revealed at some point, the percentage of um, inoculated staff? Yeah. Um yeah, I can give you a couple of different like numbers um, because like Amina had asked earlier about the um, the pool testing. So I was able to pull that up. So like as of right now, we have uh, 783 uh, students who have volunteered to do, or not volunteered, but they've uh, signed up voluntarily to do the uh, pool testing, which is a that free weekly um, trial. As far as staff are concerned with the pool testing, we've had 263. Um, so again, a little over a thousand, uh, but that's a, you know, a good number to get us started. And I think a lot of people actually, uh, the nice thing is we can add people to that each week as we go, as long as there is consent and the company is coming around to do the testing with us. You know, if, if people see uh, what's happening and it's really, it's not obtrusive at all because there was some concern, we're going to actually do a little demonstration at the school committee meeting on Tuesday night, but there was some concern about, you know, if you went for a first COVID test, you know, kind of that Q-tip that really, you know, almost touched the brain. Uh, this isn't that uh, that kind of a Q-tip. So it's it's really just on the inner part of your nose. It's not a big thing. And I think once the kids uh, see this, you know, they might start to, um, you know, be a little bit more comfortable and sign up more. But I think actually as of next Monday to be having over a thousand, um, you know, pool tests is, is going to be a good, um, a very good number. Um, as far as the um, COVID vaccines are concerned, obviously we can't talk about the individuals, but um, just to date, because we are collecting this data, I'm looking at the number now, we have 310 
of our uh, staff. And when we had originally surveyed staff to find out, you know, who would like the vaccine availability, we were trying to work with uh, Sue Roser at the health department to once the teachers were eligible to be able to vaccinate them the same way that the first responders were. And uh, I think that really would have been a great way to do it. It's just that, you know, she's not able to get the vaccine, which is um, disappointing just with the way the state kind of revamped their program. Um, but at that time we had about 700 uh, educators uh, of throughout the school system. So really any employee of the school system uh, indicating that they would like a COVID vaccine. So, you know, as of this afternoon, we have 310 uh, that, so a little less than half, but uh, 310 that have either um, received their first dose or at least have it scheduled. Um, and when then we do have some staff that have actually already had the two doses, we were able to get our nurses, um, our OTPT, um, you know, special kind of um, well, medically therapeutic staff uh, vaccinated uh, back in December. So they've already had two doses, but we have about a little less than half right now, uh, Kathy, that at least have either gotten the first dose or have it scheduled. And we're still working with them to, um, you know, with, with the others to try to get them on the, um, in the list. Great. I, I think that's great. Congratulations. Thanks for, um, thanks for everything for this year. Yeah, I mean, really. It, it's, it's been a crazy year. The support from everyone, you know, I have to say just across the board in Chelmsford has been wonderful. Um, this, you know, again, it's been very demanding on staff. I don't think we can say enough about the job that the staff have done stepping up and really trying to make this to be as normal of a year as possible. This has been a big lift on parents too, because, you know, whether parents selected, you know, remote and they have their kids home with them all day, or even if they did the hybrid, there, you know, there's, there's difficulty in scheduling that because the kids are in school two days a week, but they're still home three. So I think the parents honestly have been great. Uh, the staff have gone above and beyond uh, last spring and this school year to really make this about the very best uh, year we possibly could have had. And, you know, a testament to that is, you know, we, we do receive a, a lot of email from uh, families with questions and concerns and things along those lines. And almost to a T, they start out with, you know, thank you for everything you're doing this year. Uh, just an acknowledgement to the teachers and the support staff, whether it's the uh, paras or clerks or principals or whatnot. Um, everyone acknowledges that people are just trying the absolute hardest they can. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's been a year. So, you know, people are a little bit frustrated with uh, not getting back to routine and normalcy, but I do see at least there's some, uh, some light at the end of the horizon. So I think we'll end the school year strong. Wrong, uh, be able to take a little bit of time off this summer and regroup and refresh and uh, get ready for a great school year next fall. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, junior staff. It has been an amazing year and the support has been excellent from what we can, you know, what we have received. Thank you. Well, thanks. All right. Any other questions? Seeing and hearing none. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Greatly appreciate it. And as once again, we'll let you know once we're uh, set to have our evening of, of review and discussion, uh, just as we do with Neshova, um, and uh, invite you to attend at, when, when we review the budget at that time. Great. Uh, me and my dog will sign off for the night, and we wish you guys well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next on our agenda is a review of the budget hearing and Springtown meeting warrant ske article schedule. So we're moving right along uh, here. Uh, just pull up my schedule here. Okay, so we've gone through a good portion of the of the Warren articles and and uh, the uh, budget itself. I know next week we have the finance department coming, which includes the accounting, the assessors, information technology, treasury and collection. Um, we also have slated the um, veteran services to come next week as well, and then we have one of the citizen uh, petitions for the climate change resolution uh, slated. Also slated next week um, are the four, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, uh, four zoning bylaws and one general bylaw amendment um, that the planning board is currently um, 
reviewing. From my understanding is they their hearings are still open. Uh, they have not voted yet. Uh, and so uh, votes not expected prior to uh, our meeting next week. However, um, in discussion, I'll be reaching out to the planning board just to confirm it may be best for them to come in and, and, and begin the discussions next week about these uh, intensive articles, and then they may come back the following week on the 25th, once they've closed the public hearings and they've voted on those five, uh, just to confirm and to go over any other additional questions we might have and just to let us give us an update on where they stand with those. Also, um, on the I'm sorry, Jim. I know I scheduled the library, but I forgot when the library is coming. Oh, I'm sorry. That's also the 18th. I, I okay, thank you. Over that. Yep. So uh, 18th as well for them. Uh, so that'll be a, a pretty um, intensive evening. And then the 25th, currently we have scheduled the police department and the fire department. Um, uh, and then uh, all, all being told, I have to, we still have to reach out to um, the other, other citizen petitions, see if they wanna come in and also uh, CONCOM, see which evening they'd like to come in as well. Uh, CONCOM for the uh, transfer of the Freeman Lake parcels to the Conservation Commission. Uh, other than that, that will cover all the warrant articles and uh, budgets for this year. And so uh, with those two presentations, probably three on, on the um, 25th, we may be able to review and vote on the 25th or um, given the current schedule and the discussions on, on at Monday night at the Board of Selectmen, given the fact that it looks like uh, we, we may be moving the date, or we, we are likely moving the date of uh, town meeting. If the 25th, it looks to be a little too burdensome. We can certainly push it off another week until into April. Um, get, with, with keeping in mind that the first Thursday in April is usually um, uh, zoning board appeals evening. And so we try to avoid uh, having our meeting in, in conjunction with theirs. So it would put us in the second week of April potentially, but well, we can cross that bridge next week when we take another look at uh, what we have left and, 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 uh, decide whether or not um, we need to extend to, a, to another week to make our review and recommendations for um, town meeting. Anybody have any, any comments or anything to add with that? Sounds good to me. Do we know when we'll know uh, when town meeting actually is gonna be? So Paul can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but my understanding is the plan currently uh, is for John Kerland and another town meeting member to do much like last year on the date that the, uh, the town meeting is planned to uh, go to the senior center where it's scheduled to take place and to continue it. Uh, I think the target currently is June 21st for town meeting. However, there was some discussion that evening with the select board about whether any other time might be um, available earlier to have the meeting. And I know there are a couple of constraints and I'll leave it to uh, people to take a look at the discussion they had that night and any further discussions they may have in the next um, board select, uh, select board meeting, excuse me. Um, but essentially there are some constraints uh, both with, the, with uh, the use of uh, the senior center which currently cannot be used under um, the uh, state's regulations uh, the use of the gym that we used last year and, and for fall, uh, which um, school will still be in session if we go much earlier than the, than the June 21st and I'll create issues there. Um, there are also issues just in coverage for uh, Charles and Telemedia, whether um, it be the setup at that location, but also uh, if we bring it too close to um, Memorial Day weekend, there are lots of conflicting issues with that as well. Um, so uh, my guess is that it will be extended past um, that April date that we usually have for town meeting. And the likely target date is that June 21st, but the final set date to extend it to has not been uh, not been finalized right now. And I don't think I missed anything there, Paul. I, is anything? Uh... No, I imagine we'll, we'll be hearing from, from uh, town moderator, John Curlin, uh, he said probably by the end of the month. I think probably at the next select board meeting. Okay, thank you. All right. Do we have any public comments?
I'll skip a second because I don't have a chat box or to, to, to look at. Seeing and hearing none, do we have any press questions? Um, just going through the list here, I'm not seeing any members of the press. So I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Good night. Thank Good you. Good night.